What's up, y'all? Shout out the new merch, man. It's here, it's here, it's here. Go ahead and go to thatman.store. That's thatman.store. And you can get the hand down, man down merchandise right now. Go ahead and click that, man. We appreciate y'all. Welcome to another episode of the Mark Jackson Show. I'm Mark Jackson. We're on the Come and Talk Me Network. Shout out my guys, Cam and Mace. That is the dynamic one, my guy, Blue. We got a special, special guest today. But first, let's pay some bills, Blue. I got you, Pops. Sell, sell to underdog. Don't forget, click the link in the description and use the promo code MARK. That's M-A-R-K. They're matching the first time deposit of up to $1,000, and you'll get a special pick. Also, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, Pops. You better not mess up this intro. Do your thing, man. I can't mess up this one. This is Brooklyn's finest. Brooklyn's <laughs> finest. What a Brooklyn's finest. Royalty, Academy Award winner, director and producer extraordinaire, known as the mayor of Madison Square Garden, recently inducted into Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. The dude is a Hall of Famer. Recently also won an award presented by President Biden, Dr. Jill Biden, the President's Committee on Arts and the Humanities, the National Medal of Arts. The guy's an absolute legend, Brooklyn's own. It's orange and blue skies, the one and only Spike Lee's in the house. Mark, thank you. You know, we go way back, and it, it, it's great to see your son with you. I mean, family, legacy, beautiful thing. That's, 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 beautiful that's the thing. truth. But let me, let me ask you a question, though. I'm watching you. Watch the Yankees advance to the World Series. How special was that? <laughs> pop, pops, pops, hold up, hold up, pop. The Yankees? We not talking about the Yankees before we talk about the Liberty. We got to talk. <laughs> spike, Spike, t- pop, sit, sit, sit to the side, pop. <laughs> what was it like being courtside and seeing the Liberty bring it home, man? It was great, and I have to give out love to Clara Wu, who called me up out of the blue and said, Spike, I want you to sit next to me for the for the playoffs. And I said, bet. My office <laughs> is four blocks away from Barkley Center. <laughs> Barkley Center at the corner intersection of Atlantic and Flatbush. Mark, as you know, down the block from Junior's. <laughs> yes, sir. Junior's Cheesecake. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Absolutely. And the McDonald's sitting right there, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're not talking about McDonald's. You saw what happened the other day, though. You hear about it? Yes, I heard about it. Yes, I did. <laughs> we don't, we don't get, yeah. we're all get like getting sick and then blame it on the both of us. <laughs> that, that's true about that. But but you, she gave you permission to sit next to her. When I watched I mean, you, not you permission. Was, she asked me to be her guest. But you wasn't sitting in the seat. You was you was on, on the floor with, with your knees on the floor and your hands on the wall. Is that the new Spike Lee look? No, I've done that plenty times at guard. You know, that's in my prayer mood. <laughs> Lord, Lord of basketball, please let those prayers come down. We got to win this. <laughs> so you're telling me he answered at the Barclays Center, but he don't answer at Madison Square Garden? Well, as I said before he came on the air, this ring around my neck is the championship ring, the New York Knicks, the last time they had world championship, the 72-73 season. That's a long time ago, Spike. How long? That's a lot of Too unanswered long. prayer. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel, I mean, I'm not, I'm not worried about what happened last night. We, we, we got a squad. I believe in Leon Rose, Coach Tibbs. This is our year. You're not I've worried at all? Year since 72, <laughs> <laughs> but, like but you're not worried Dodger, at all? Like old Brooklyn Dodger fans would say, well, we can't be the Yankees, but wait next year. Wait till next year. Wait till next year. But you're not worried at all. I mean, watching last night. Well, there's, 80, there's 81 more regular season games. What's, what's, right? your, what's your initial thoughts? Or last night? Yeah. Or, or just seeing the team first, I mean, they the hit, first what, time seeing this new team. What, the, the, they, the Celtics hit like 53 pointers or something like that. I yeah, mean, yeah. What, they set the record, so. Look, they can have that. They, they, they got their ring and they got to raise the banner. All right. <laughs> what's your what's your thoughts on the Julius Randle, Dante DiVincenzo, the trade? Obviously, you got a legit big man in Conte Towns, but you gave up something. I, I think what happened when Hardenstein, and I'm not mad at him, 
to got his the Knicks cannot pay him. He went to OKC, and then Mitchell Robinson wasn't coming back to January at the earliest. So there was a big hole at the five, and uh, Leon Rose did what he had to do. And you know, I, I was sports, and you know, Mark, it's it's it's. It's not just the players, but when the whole when the guy if someone gets traded, man, you got to uproot your family. You got to get your kid a new school. I mean, so it was sad. And then then I then I heard that Minnesota was not going to make the trade unless Dante was was in, was a part of it. But he was feeling a special. <laughs> Dante was feeling a special way at that that preseason game. So I don't, who knows what happened when it's a real game. He did not want to go, and I don't blame him. Now, I know the answer. I would think that you would be nicer to guys that played for the Knicks and come back into town. Oh, oh they're getting a big hug. Yeah, yeah. I got a big hug, too, but when the game started, you was talking trash. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, we were, especially when you were on the Pacers. That's right. That, 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 didn't, that didn't work for me, man. <laughs> you didn't like those days? Oh, it, it was phenomenal. I mean, that whole Reggie. And here's the thing that I like to say, because I asked Reggie about this. Separately, people asked Reggie Miller and I, separately, do we, the Reggie and I, hate each other? Still today, that was like, what, 20 something years ago? Me and Reggie are mad cool, respect each other, love each other, saw each other at a. Springfield for the, the latest Hall of Fame. So just want to say, me and Reggie, boom. That was a long time ago. And it's unfortunate to happen. But uh, we, we, we love each other, respect each other. Well, you, you walked right into it. Many accolades over the years for you. But something new is the Hall of Fame. What was, what, what, what's that like? Well, I didn't even know super fans were in the, could be a fan, could be in a, Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. So I got the call from my guy, Charlie. You know Charlie. He was making like, I said, what? And then they're going with Al Horswick of uh, the six man in Philly. I know I pronounced his last name wrong. Billy Crystal and the great Jack Nichols who couldn't make it. I mean, I grew up watching Jack courtside at the, at the, at the Fabulous Forum. You know, talking to all the cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, here I am, here, here I am, growing up. As you know, Mark, the old garden, every section had different color. And I was in the blues, you know, where you touch the roof. And sometimes, you know, you still SDO card. So I grew up watching those great, that great Celtic Laker rivalry. And... and Seeing Jack, you know, courtside, and I said, "Oh Lord, <laughs> if I ever make some money, I'm gonna get some season tickets." <laughs> and here's the thing, though. So, when you heard this, you, Mark, what do you think about the Busher and and uh, that pick? You know what I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't there, but thank God. I don't know if the envelope was hot or cold, but it was Patrick Ewing. And so I ran to the subway, got in the subway, and waited online. So I got my season tickets for the Knicks the day after the Knicks got Patrick Ewing. And so I was in the green. So every year, I moved down. But a- I, I, I started in the blue. That's all my father could afford, the blue seats up in the, the blue skies, the blue heavens. Spike, I actually used to be a ball boy, and I heard a story that Pat used to send send the ball boys up to go get tickets to you to give you better seats. Is that is that accurate? No, because Patrick's rookie year, I had seats. Okay. But I will tell you, though, that when the Knicks were home, Oakley would come out first, and if he would see if I was there, he would throw me the ball. And then I'd throw it back to him. You remember that, Mark? Yes, I do remember that. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're, you're telling me that Dave Snowden, our dear friend that was a ball boy for the Knicks, 
he claimed he used to come up to the top of the garden and give you Patrick's tickets and bring you down to Patrick's spot. So he, Dave is lying to us? I don't – look, he might have might have been getting me closer, but I had my – Patrick's rookie year it was my first year season tickets for the Knicks, the green seats. Now, he might have – I don't remember that, but if Dave says it's true, it means that I was just sitting with the uh, with Rita. <laughs> <laughs> It, it won't be the first time he lied to us, but that's the, that's the amazing thing. A, story, a, a movie should be made on your life because people think you all of a sudden got to the to the floor seats. You started way, 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 way up. The blue you worked your way down. You sat in the blue, right? Absolutely. Well, I, I couldn't afford it, but when we went to a game, that's where we sat. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Did you? And, and then you went. Your, your, your father took you, right? Absolutely. My father took me. Mark, I went to you. I'm older than you. I went to the old garden. Wow. On Eighth Avenue, they used to have the ECAC Holiday Festival. So it's funny because my love of sports comes from my father, and my love of movies comes from my movie. My mother, my mother was a a cinephile, but my father hated Hollywood films. Hated them. So since I'm the eldest of, of, of my siblings, I was my mother's movie date. So. It worked out, you know, both the great thing, as you know, everybody's influenced by our, our parents, but directly sports and cinema. Well, you brought up something very important, which I want to tie to this next question. LeBron and Bronny, what they were able to accomplish the other night in the first game, being the first father-son duo to ever play an NBA game. Talk about the pressure, because you had the privilege and honor of working with your dad also, so how special right. was that moment? Well, I don't think we could compare. It'll be a fair comparison because the work I did with my father the, is for the audience to let you know my father's a great musician, Bill Lee, and great jazz musician, composer. So my father did the scores for my films. I was an undergrad at NYU graduate film school. Then she's going to have it, School Days, Do the Right Thing, and Mo Better Blues. So the work we did was alone in a room with Bronny. <laughs> that thing is in um, public for the whole world to see. So that's 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 the big difference. But it was special nevertheless. Oh, yeah, it's still special. I understand the comparison is probably stretching, but how special was it overall working with your dad on a film project? Well, my father was a jazz purist. And I grew up, you know, 60s. And if he came in the house, I heard the Beatles, or even Motown, he said, turn that bad music off my house. <laughs> <laughs> Jazz purists. So we have those little, Mark, I'm older than you, but them little transistor radios. <laughs> it wasn't even FM, just AM. And my father, he was the go-to guy as far as on bass, Bob Dylan, the first Peter, the first Simon and Garfunkel album he's on, Aretha, I mean, and then when Bob Dylan went electric, everybody went electric. And my father refused to play electric bass. He played upright. So thank God, so my mother had to work. Or we would have starved. Because he was like, <laughs> he was like, I'm a jazz purist, you know. I don't like electric. I'm not playing electric music. So thank God my mother, she had to work. She started teaching at St. Anne's in, in Brooklyn Heights. And my mother was working, grading papers, cleaning, cooking, five, five crazy kids. <laughs> and for a minute, you know, for a while, I felt a certain way about my mother happened to, to support the family. But later I understood my mother believed my father's music and she supported him. So once I got into film school and when he graduated film school, he did the he did this, the scores for my films and then my feature films in order. She's going to have it, School Days, Do the Right Thing, Mo Better Blues. So that was a, that was a lesson to me the, that 
Of course, the sacrifice I was going to make was not going to be like I had f- five kids. But made me understand later on that you got to be true. You know, I had, I had ideals, stuff I wanted to do, and I was not going to jeopardize the, the vision I wanted to put on the movie screens. Now, let me ask you. Well, is, did you ever go to the, the, the Duffield back in the day? Come on. Where? The Duffield Theater. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Downtown Brooklyn. EJ Corbett's a <laughs> You're taking me back now. Back in the backpack. That's Brooklyn, baby. Brooklyn. <laughs> we grew up. Now, think about it. You went, you started on the top of the garden. You worked your way down to the, to the, to the floor seats. You, you, you left school, and it took you four years to make your first film. Am I correct? Oh, I finished 79, 81. 80. No. Oh, 82, 83. Yeah, three years. I graduated and when you graduated film school in 82, and She's Gonna Have It came out in 1986. That's four years, Spike, so I did my yeah. homework. I was right. Yeah. <laughs> but it, did, You're it right. didn't happen. People think it happened overnight. You, you, you were... And, 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 and Mark, thank you for bringing it up, because that's something that people assume with any successful person. The arts, sports, especially basketball, like, Mark, like you brothers came out the womb jumping and dribbling. <laughs> and you're like, boom, we're there. But because they don't see the hard work, the sacrifices, the blood, sweat, and tears. And that's why I, 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 I have so much respect for athletes. I don't care if you're the last person on the team. You know, you busted your ass to get there and to see great athletes go head to head, toe to toes. I mean, and it can be heartbreaking too because Michael Jordan, he killed us. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, Knicks weren't the only team, but that's sick. Mike was ruling, man. He was like, what can you do? Also, were you born in Cumberland Hospital? I was born in Brooklyn Jewish Hospital. All right. Because I grew up in Fort Greene, the fort where you went to high school, Bishop Lockman. There's a hospital, there's a hospital in Fort Greene called Cumberland Hospital. Bernard and Albert King were born there. Legends. Mike Tyson Legends. and the GOAT, Michael Jordan. All four of them brothers were born in Fort Greene, Cumberland Hospital. <laughs> you know that? I did not know that. You know Mike was born in Brooklyn? No, I knew he was born in Brooklyn. I didn't know what hospital. Fort Green, baby, the fort. <laughs> Spike, I know you said a few a few movies that you worked on. One of my favorites that, that my pops introduced me to young was Do the, Do the Right Thing. You mm. have any memories that stand out from that time working on that? It, I wrote that script in... Beginning of 1988, we shot it in the summer of 88. And it came out in 1989. And if anybody sees that film today, knowing it came out in 89, we talked about global warming, gentrification. I mean, how can we look at that film today with the NYPD strangulation, Ray Raheem, and not thinking about George Floyd. I mean, we, and that's why <laughs> over the years, <laughs> my friends be calling me Negro Domus. Like, how you know what else is going to happen 20 years later? And, oh, and, and man, that is Negro Domus is also the N word Domus. <laughs> Absolutely. Love. But I had, I hate. mean, I can't. Explain it, but I just saw what what was happening then. And it's more, it's more a statement of how far we advance if the stuff I was showing in 89 is still here with us today. Yeah. In fact, there's a there's some dialogue in this in, in Sal's Fame Pizzeria where we're even mentioning Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but that was a very, very, uh, we were blessed with that film. And uh, in my office, Mark, you ever seen my office in Fort Greene? You got to come by. I drove by. You didn't let me in. I, I, I <laughs> don't say it. Anyway, <laughs> on the, on the off, in front of the office, we have murals. So all the people in the film, they're no longer with us. And, and it's like, it's every year we're getting more and more losing more of the people that, that helped make that film, that lifted that film to the status it has today. Think about how tough that is for you. These people had something to do with the legend of Spike Lee. And we're, oh, and yeah. we're losing them each year. I mean, my father recently, Ruby D, Ozzy Davis, Danny Ello, Danny Ello the third, Rick Ello, uh, Robin Harris. You know, Robin, great, great, funny, funny, funny. And uh Who was Radio Raheem's real name? Bill Nunn. Yeah, absolutely. And Bill Nunn, Bill Nunn went to Morehouse w- with Samuel Jackson. They were there together. So when I graduated, they were still in Atlanta doing uh, local theater. So my father went to Morehouse. My grandfather went. When my father was a freshman, Dr. Mark Luther King was a senior. Wow. And, Mark Lu- and Martin Luther King III and I are classmates, class of 79. And my mother... And grandmother went to Spelman. Those are two historic black schools across street from, across street from each other in, in Atlanta, Georgia. And when and also I was there, the Atlanta Hawks used to practice at Morehouse's gym. At Morehouse? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's the guy? What's the guy? Who's the he was the coach of the Hawks? And he does he does games now. Who Mike Patello. Mike Who? Mike Patello. No, older than that. Lenny Wilkins? You sure it wasn't no. Mike Patello? No, the, before him. He does TNT commentating. The color. Oh, you talking, oh, Ernie Johnson. No, he coached the Atlanta Hawks. No, Mike Patello got to be the answer. <clears throat> no, John Drew was on the team. There's nobody that coached the Hawks is on TNT before Mike Patello. Well, T... ESPN. What's the guy's name? He coached the Atlanta Hawks. <laughs> Somebody did. Blue, get on You're the... You're not talking about Doug Collins. No, <laughs> Blue, get on the <clears throat> safari. <laughs> We're not going on till we find out who I'm talking about. Look at Spike, I'm director on his name. the Mark Jackson show. Let me see. <laughs> What's his All name? Right, let me see. If it's not Mike Fratello, I say there's no other answer. It's before I'm, Mike Fratello. I'm not stab baby. Hold on, hold on. Let me see. Give me a second. All right. Lee Corso? No. Atlanta Hawks. They played in the Omni. <laughs> this is good. Hold on, this hold on. Good. Let me see. Huey Brown. Yes. Oh, there you go. go, coach. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Oh, you said you threw me off with TNT. Yeah, ESPN, the legend. All right, my bad. But... We he Man. we we he he used to let us sit in the stands for the workouts, and he'd be cursing John Drew. <laughs> that was coach. That was him. How do you forget his name? He was he's part of the Blue and Orange Skies. He was coaching the head head coach of the New York Knicks for years. I met getting old. <laughs> <laughs> You can see now. <laughs> so, let, let me let me ask you. Yeah. Talking about the Yankees, is it true? I saw I saw I read an article and I saw a piece. Oh, the red hat. Yes. Yeah. Let me you tell the story. The, you you started the the. Let me tell colors. the story. Can I tell the story? Can I give you? <laughs> let him tell the story. Okay, I, I threw the assist. Go ahead. All right, but but you you're from Brooklyn, so you know what this gesture means. <laughs> <laughs> Our uh, Paisan brothers. <laughs> hey, let me tell a story. So I had just gotten this fly starter jacket, black jacket with with Yankees and script. It was the World Series. Yankees were playing Atlanta Braves World Series, and I had just gotten. I went to Paragon. You know what Paragon is? <laughs> Got this fly. 
puffer jacket, black, and Yankees written in script, red. So I need a hat to go <laughs> with the jacket. So I called New Era, and you have to you have to understand that there was no uh, there was no alternates. Every team had one hat, and that's it. One color. There was no like it is crazy now. It's, it's insane now. But back then, there's all, all, all teams in Major League Baseball only had one hat. I wanted a red hat. Call up New Era. They said, Spike, we can't do that. So you're going to have to call George. The only person that can okay that is George Steinbrenner. <laughs> I said, this is a true story. I said, bet. Somehow I got the George Steinbrenner. We talked. He said, Spike, you can have a red hat. So game three and four, I'm sitting, I'm sitting like a couple rows behind the boss and they put the camera on the hat. <laughs> <laughs> that's when it started. That was a similar moment where it's like, we could have a different hat, a different color. That's the story. True. Mr. Steinbrenner made it happen. You gotta get some money. Even picked up the phone. (laughs) Do you know how big of an influence that is? How much money has been made? Who are you telling? (laughs) (laughs) Who are you telling? Every team got nine million hats now, and those new hats ain't. They ain't. Here's the thing, though. I got a problem. Grown men still keeping that sticker on on the on the brim. I'm with you. I'm with you. They're too old for that. I'm with you. Time take out. The stick, take what? the stick off. It's, you left the store. Take, take it we off. We know it's New Era with the symbol, <laughs> with the logo on the side. It was, only 35, it was $35. It's not like you flex it. Take the stick off. Spike take, Lee has a problem with the dude with the stick. The dude with the blue take, and orange hat on right now. You're seven years old and you're wearing the stick around the hat on the top of the bill. Spike, I've seen I'm, you sitting courtside with some of your outfits and jackets and hats. No sticker on it. <laughs> what was it? Oh, did you no, the stick off? No. I don't need the store with the sticker on. That, what do you need the sticker on it for? Listen to, you, listen, he, to, listen, to, listen to the youth. Listen to your son. Take please the please, please, off, please call your father. Call your father. Tell there your was, father's up. There was somebody watching roll, you at man. the World let's Series let's, saying, why, why you need a red Yankee hat? Stick with the blue and white. You changed the game. Oh, I, I'm acknowledging that. <laughs> <laughs> we're not. We're talking about the sticker on the hat. You trying to change the subject? <laughs> you changed the game. True story. On a side note, I know I've, I've read before that on on the, working on Malcolm X, some of the finances it was difficult to secure them. Oh uh, yeah. I don't know if you want to touch on that or, or maybe. Oh yeah, share, we can. Yeah, yeah, maybe touch on some of those stories. When we knew, I did the film Warner Brothers, and the producer Marvel Warfare had been trying to make that film many, many years. So, with the great, great Denzel Washington, we started making that film knowing at some point we could run out of money. And the day of the riots, excuse me, the day of the uprising in L.A. with the verdict of those cops walking free. That same day, we show Warner Brothers, Terry Semmel and Bob Daly, the two co-heads, the crew chairman, two, two co-chairmen of Warner Brothers, the film. That was a four-hour cut. <laughs> and to their credit, they stayed the whole four hours while L.A. was burning down. Off and on, the secretaries would come and hand them notes like... They probably they probably had to get a helicopter out of the, out of the studios, so eventually it came down to the length, and I was not gonna. I was not gonna cut the testicles off this film. Excuse me if I'm being. No, you good. Brutish, but that's we. I wasn't gonna do it, and they said okay. So Warner Brothers gave the film to the bond company. 
And shortly after, everybody was in post-production, got a registered mail, a, a letter, registered mail, saying, you know, your service no longer needed. So they were fired. Wow. And I, I got paid $2 million for that film. And I put half my salary in it, and I couldn't do it anymore. So I was stuck. Wow. And, then, and, and, and before doing a film, I became a student of Malcolm X. Read everything he did, speeches. I, was, I became a student of Malcolm X. And, he, and one thing, I kept thinking about what he said for Black people. Self-determination, self-reliance. And then it hit me like a lightning bolt. I know some black folks. They got some money. <laughs> and I, I got their phone numbers. But here was a tricky thing. This situation, there weren't, they could, they could, there's no way to get a piece of the film. Hmm. It would have to be straight up a straight up gift. Straight up gift. And I made up a list of these individuals. And I have to apologize. Oh, it's, it's been my memories, but I always forget somebody. So please forgive me if I do. But the first person on my list was Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby. This is before all the other stuff. Anyway, call him up. Boom. He says, Spike, come to sales. Put the check in the mail. I said, now I'm coming to your house. Took got on the subway, went to his house up east side, rang the bell. He said, come on in. I said, ah, no, thank you. I, I said, thank you for the check. <laughs> ran to the bank <laughs> ran to the bank before <laughs> then Miss Winfrey Tracy Chapman Prince Janet Jackson there's an African American woman uh, Peggy Cooper Capers who for Lampertus excuse that mispronunciation that's a Brooklynese right there and so I had to and every time I got money, I was asking for more. Because I was feeling myself. Okay, this, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. So Bill Cosby, he he got the lowest. I was escalating. And so, Jackson, son and father. Here's the science. Keep the science. The last two were Magic and Michael. Wow, wow. So, Call up magic, boom. So, Michael, Brooklyn's finest. You know how Mark, you know how competitive it is. Competitive. <laughs> so I just let it slip how much magic gave. <laughs> <laughs> boom. So these individuals saved Malcolm X. And we kept it quiet. I was able to hire everybody that had been fired for post-production. Wow. And then on Malcolm X's birthday, no, no, it wasn't Malcolm's birthday, but I think it was, I forgot the date, but a special date, I gave a press conference at the Schomburg Library in Harlem, 135th Street and Lenox, and announced that these African-Americans donated, saved the film, and lo and behold, the next day, Warner Brothers took the film back from the uh, <clears throat> people who had the film, and we went and went, the rest is history, history. But it came down to being the student of Malcolm and remembering what we should do as a people. Self-determination, self self-reliance. That was the key. And once I understood that, I said, I know some black folks. So every time I see Mike, every time I see, I, I give people a hug. They're like, Spike, I know, I know that was 20 years ago. I don't care. Because they saved my butt. And the world, I did not want the world to see a truncated version of Malcolm X. Couldn't do that. Let me ask you, um, one, one, one quote that you had that I wrote down that's blessed me, and I'm sure when you made the phone calls, you named the people that said yes, but you had a bunch of folks that said no. You said, no, that's not you true. Said, but here's a quote but that you said that, that blessed me, and maybe in life. Don't be deterred by the no's. 
I I go over that today, but no one I the no one on my list said no. That's a blessing. Yes. <laughs> that's, you call that's, that's a belief that's... In, in your gift and your ability to execute it. Well, Mark, I there was a great I mean, I had many sleepless nights. The blue and, and Mark. I mean, many I was tossing and turning. I was in the jam. Warner Brothers no longer had to film. No longer had to film. They gave it to. They gave it, you know, let the people with the money. I mean, like it was a limbo. And I said before, I got paid two million, and I already put a million of my dollars already in the budget, which I never got back. And you didn't want to turn your wife into your mom. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't married yet. Then. But it, 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 you, you, it's, there's nothing more in, in Mark. That was not the only blessing I've got. You know, I've I've had a blessed life, and so often it could have went that way or this way, but it went straight. And there have been times where. Malcolm X being one of them where I thought that I would never make a film again. And that I hate to say this, but I was cursing God. I'm ashamed to say that. But it was a low point in my life. And it wasn't like we were doing this film secretly. I mean, even when it was announced, black folks coming out of woodwork saying, they didn't say that, they weren't saying that about Denzel, but they were saying, Spike, you better not F that film up. Black folks let me know <laughs> in no certain terms. You just as my mother would say, you better not mess this up you, with your skinny, rusty black butt. You better not. <laughs> <laughs> my mom, I mean, she wasn't alive, but I can hear her telling me, your skinny, rusty butt better not mess this up. So it was a, a, a burden on me. And I was losing weight, couldn't eat, couldn't keep stomach. I mean, couldn't keep food on my stomach. I was a nervous wreck. And I prayed and prayed. And I, I'm, I'm, ashamed to, I'm ashamed to say that I cursed God, but I did. And this is the first time I've ever said that to anybody. But I, but that didn't last long. Cause when you get knocked down, you put your hands on a rope and pull your skinny black <laughs> off. <laughs> right. And, and, and then the, the performance that Denzel gave. That's my. That's my, let me ask you this question, because I watch Steph Curry shoot every day. I watch Clay Thompson shoot every day, mm -hmm. and it was at an incredible level, witnessing greatness, where I just had to sit there and watch. You sat there and watched Denzel, who I believe is the greatest actor mm -hmm. of all time. You watched yeah. him perform on a day-to-day -day basis. How was that? It is great, but I want to know, I want to let you know that I'm in post-production of my fifth film with Denzel. <laughs> in order, Mo Better Blues, Malcolm X, he got game Inside Man. Inside Man was 18 years ago. So Denzel and I had not worked for a minute. But the first day we got together, it was like, Inside Man was like yesterday. But there's a scene in Malcolm X where he was, there's a scene where there's a speech. And back then, this was not digital. This is film. So you had thousand foot rolls in the film. Once the film rolls, you just know. There was a scene where he's giving a speech. We, I mean, this is a packed, extras, everything. And I'm standing next to my great cameraman, Ernest Dickerson. And he's, he's telling me, Spike, we're about to roll out. And I see that I'm looking at the script. And he's just, he just seems to be done. But I'm not going to call cut. He keeps going. <laughs> and finally, the film rolled out. I went over to Denzel, 
and he was in a daze. I said, D, what was that? He said, Spike, I can't, I can't even tell you what I said. But here's the thing, though. This is the science. Denzel stopped work a year before. He prepared for the future great age in Ed Lamana. I'm not working. He prepared for a year for that role. Stop eating pork, no alcohol, learn how to read Arabic, pray, you know, do the prayer in, in, in Arabic and the Quran. He put the work in. A year, he, he, he rehearsed and put the work in for a year before we began to shoot. And here's the thing, though. What Denzel was saying when he said, I don't remember what I said, his, his vessel was open. So the spirit of Malcolm came in him. But that, does, that doesn't happen overnight. That took a year. It took a year. And he was, he, he didn't know where he was. He didn't remember what he said. And that's and, and the sports thing. That's being in the zone, right, Mark? Mm, that's right. But that doesn't happen overnight. You know about yourself, Mark. The audience in the movie theaters or the people sitting at the arenas, they do not, they do not see the work, the blood, sweat, and tears. They only see the product of that. They only, we don't witness. I was, I, mean, I, I was there directing the movie, so the audience never saw what Denzel had to do. They just saw the final product. And 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 and, and, and I, I've been teaching thirty years at the graduate film school NYU, the graduate film school, and I tell my students, please do not think that the Almighty, his, he's because his. His hand's going to come out of heavens and point you the next one. You got to put the work in. I don't care what you're doing. That old, and, and the thing that hurts is that this so-called fallacy of an overnight success. Now, the difference between overnight success and flash in the pan, flash in the pan don't last. One hit, one hit wonder, had one good year, then an antidote, you know. Mark, you know what I'm talking about. You gotta put the work in. There's there's no there's no shortcut. I don't care what you're doing. There's no shortcuts. Actually, you're shortcutting yourself. You preaching. Hey. He's yeah, right I now. mean, it, I'm not, I mean, is this I've said this before. I've said it's my class. So, you know, don't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> and then another thing, Mark, I know you agree with me. Where we, we've both seen, I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'll, I'll stick to my thing, film, and you could go to sports, basketball, but great, great talents. But something just. Absolutely. You 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 like, oh my God, this guy can do, or this woman can do, like, and then like, it's like, you like, and and and, and for me, it's sad because we all have God given gifts, and to see people to have gifts, what I'm not I'm not sticking just to athletics, but have singing, dance, whatever it is, and you don't dig deep enough in the God-given gifts, in the gifts that God gave you. And, and that's, for me, that's, that's, will you, will you take advantage of the gifts God gives you? That's like a, a rebuking God. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs>
Don't let me get. Don't let me get the Ebenezer. <laughs> <laughs> That's good stuff, right there. No, that don't put me in the pulpit. No, no. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> we are all given God-given gifts, and if you don't accept and nurture that gift, that's rebuking God. I think. He's been. That's, yeah, that's powerful. He <laughs> <laughs> spit just now, Pop. What what people don't realize is when you. We've seen greatness, whether it be directing, singing, rapping, playing mm -hmm. ball, whatever. We've seen right. it on the corners. Right. We've seen it on the corners or in the playgrounds every day, wasted. You started, there was only one African-American filmmaker when you started. I believe I believe it was Cooley High, right? Did, did, did Cooley High? Uh, 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 Michael Schultz. Absolutely. I mean, they were, independent, they were black independent filmmakers, but Hollywood is Michael Schultz. Yeah, but Hollywood. And yeah. you had to take a risk and act on your gift. And we're all these years later because you moved on your gift. Well, I didn't grow up one out. To be honest, growing up on the streets of Brooklyn, I wanted to play second base for the Mets. But genetics conspired against that. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm doing now, I don't think is a mistake. I don't think it's a mistake. I mean, I was, when we say born to or whatever the word you want to use, but I'm doing what I was putting this earth to do. And Mark, and, and, and you're, you're agreeing with, I mean, it's, it's just so many things that, that, that we agree on. And when you're, this is why I really tell my students, when you're able to make a living doing what you love, there's no greater gift than that. That's right. A, the majority of this world go to the grave having worked at a job they hated. But when you're going to a job that you love, you're not going to be hitting the, the button on the alarm. <laughs> You don't need the alarm. You jump out of bed. You don't need, I don't need alarm clock. <laughs> I know we all call the 6 a.m. And it's like built-in alarm clock. I know I got to wake up and I don't need an alarm clock. Because I'm going to a job I love. That's a blessing. That's a great point. My dad once told me, he said, find a job you love and you'll never work another day in your life. Boom! Your father was given dropping that knowledge, you know, as you you and your, and your siblings as, as uh, growing up in Brooklyn. You know, so I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. And, and then to have friends like you, I mean, I mean, let me get a quick story. Growing up, who are my guys in New York? Growing up, Willie Mays, Muhammad Ali, Joe Namath, and then Will Frazier, Clyde, as a kid. I mean, dude, I had those guys on the pedestal. And then later on in life, I get to meet them in person. <laughs> and they know who I am. Oh, I mean, when you meet your, and I know this thing saying, they will meet your heroes. I'm sorry. I've never had a bad experience with my heroes. Maybe I'm lucky. But. Maze, Ali, Will Frazier, Joe Willie Namath? <laughs> I'm talking about Broadway Joe. <laughs> Great. And all beautiful people, too. I'm not just talking about, I mean, not just talking about their sports exploits, but just beautiful people, you know? 
I, I tell this. I, I, I went I, like this. The alley, the spike, that rope of doing. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't square up, Dolly. Yeah. <laughs> It was like this, though. <laughs> <laughs> Spike, what was what was the Morehouse experience like? Oh, it was a great experience. I said before, my father and grandfather went there. And that's why I learned to be a man down there. And I was lucky, though, because I had a grandmother that lived four blocks away. And my grandmother is my grandmother. Listen, this, this is a great story. I'm glad you reminded me of this because I, I forgot I was going to say this. My grandmother taught art in the South, Macon, Atlanta, Georgia. 50 years, my grandmother never had, my grandmother never had one white student because of Jim Crow laws. Wow. And for 50 years, wow. my grandmother saved her Social Security checks for her grandchildren. And since I'm the oldest, I had first dibs. So my grandmother helped me get through Morehouse. Wow. My grandmother helped me get through NYU graduate film school. She gave me the seed number, the seed, excuse, the seed money, excuse me, she gave me the seed money for my thesis film, Joe's Best Side of Barbara's We Cut Heads, and gave me the seed, the seed money for She's Gonna Have, my first feature film. And that, I mean, my father's a jazz, so she wasn't making any money. So my grandmother, and here's a, another thing I like to say. In, in, in not all black parents, but black parents have a certain reaction to when their children want to go into arts. Because they don't see, don't see like, what's the route? They know that in business, well, you're going to go get your undergrad degree and go to business school and you can know, law, med school, law school, boom. But you're going to, we're paying, oh, we took out a second loan in the house so you could be a painter, <laughs> a dancer, a writer, a poet. Hell no. <laughs> but my parents, or my grandma, they never, not just me, my siblings too, they never discouraged us from having a life in the arts. And, and, and I, I thank my parents and, and my grandparents for that. Because that's not, that's not all that, not what I said a lot of times, like, parents are like, and it's not like they don't want what's best for their children, but they just don't see how being a painter or a poet or musician is going to lead to how you pay your rent, you know, and that type of stuff, you know. Zimmy Wheat the Shelton, she, she did all that, saved the Social Security checks for 50 years. Wow. 50 years. And it just, the interest. <laughs> <laughs> She wow. saved it. Absolutely. So, and, and then, and then, I'm not the only person that their parents or grandparents has saved up, or you know. So, we we've done this for our children to for the next generation. Yeah. To keep that legacy going, because you know, this country was built on our free labor for 400 years. So we we're still trying to catch up. Yeah. So we could talk about our parents and grandparents, but you're lucky, you know, and you go far. I mean, everybody doesn't have Alex Haley in their family, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they go back to prove to get things. <laughs> but our ancestors did this for us. They looked far ahead and hoped that one day that their and their one day their offspring would be, you know, not in the cotton field or whatever. From from sun from sun up to sundown. So that's another thing I really started digging deeper to the ancestors because we could say you know put everything on God, but again not discredit the Almighty. But our ancestors are there too. No, it says faith without works is dead. So yes, our put ancestors the are there. On. They're the ones that see you about to make a step. 
<laughs> and you fall off a cliff, and they turn your skinny, rusty butt <laughs> around. <laughs> it's a, uh, don't take that step. That's our ancestors doing that. And we got to, if we can, try to connect with those spirits that are out there looking for us. We're not here alone. We can't see them, but we can feel them. If you open up, you know, to get that 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 spirit that that you know, we're just not walking around alone. Worth. If you if you if you if you put yourself in a position to be open, you're gonna get that those gifts, I think. Let me ask you a question, a couple more questions. We certainly appreciate all your time. Who uh, you can I, I thought yeah, I was wondering if I was ever going to get an invite on this show. <laughs> <laughs> this just then. We, we, in all we, due this, time. You know, we go way back, man. We go way back, love. My tell love. them how this was in back. the making, but we had to hold off until you got into the Hall of Fame because we didn't want to break <laughs> the news. We, Spike wanted us to be the first interview after the Hall of Fame. That's, yes. that's how long we go back. Yeah. But who wins, who wins the East and who wins the West? Well, of course, people are going to say, I'm biased, but I think this is a year. This ring I wear around my neck, this is a ring from the 1972-73 World <laughs> Champion New York. <laughs> what year was that, Spike? 72-73. That's the year where we had, the backcourt was Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce backcourt. Earl of Pearl Monroe and Walt, Walt I'm, a, I'm, I'm an Earl of Pearl Monroe guy. You're a Walt Frazier guy. <laughs> and, and, and I know how you feel when you name the four guys because I got Earl Pearl Monroe's number in my phone and I pinch myself every time I call or text him because he was <laughs> he's the guy that allowed me to dream as a basketball player. Yes, and 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 if I may say this quickly, he got game as a homage to him. Wow. You know, because Earl's name in this in, in Philadelphia was Black Jesus. Yes. And there's a scene he got game where the great Denzel Washington explains to Ray Allen where he got the name Jesus. You weren't named after Jesus of Nazareth. You were named after Jesus of Philly. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Earl was my technical consultant on the film. So every time there was a basketball scene, he was there right by me watching the monitor. Wow. Yeah, true story. Now you couldn't find a, a a part with me standing on the fence or doing something in the movie. I mean, I'm Brooklyn's own. I'm your guy. You couldn't find. Hey, that that was any, a mistake on my see, part. Just standing there. What team were you on then? Were you on the Indiana back then? At, when we made that. You're in I'm North. I forgot the year was made. I, I would have made time to, to to stand on the fence or do something. <laughs> Just, just say you dropped the ball. But man. we had a pickup game you could have played. There's a scene in the movie where there's a pickup game on the Coney Island court. But, uh, the point is, I didn't. You no, didn't that seems more in speed. Hey, that's, I messed that, up. That seems more in speed. Get him on the Coney Island court. He want to be Jesus Subtleworth. Sit, sit down, Pops. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, you know, people still come up to me and talk about that that film. You know, he got games. And, you know, Denzel played uh Junior Varsity, and PJ Charisma was his coach. Yes. Yeah. Now how true is how true is that one on one scene with Ray oh, Allen and Denzel? Can we end on this? Yes. All right. That cl climactic scene in the film. He got game. Coney Island, father against son. It was the best. First person to get 11, 11 baskets. And the script says that Jesus wins over his son, Jake. Jake and Jesus Shuttlesworth. The script says it was written. I wrote that. Father, his son, someone beat the father 11 zip. But Denzel was like, F that. <laughs> <laughs> and Denzel Ray Allen doesn't I mean this is his first movie so whatever the script says he's gonna do but 
he should have known that Denzel was not in again. He didn't care what I wrote. He was not <laughs> be and be immortalized in this film losing eleven nothing. So Denzel started shooting stuff. Was going in. <laughs> what was going in? I mean, there's a scene where Denzel did an under oop. He made the shot and then a completely ran around the court in a circle. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had a, a a great, great acting teacher named Susan Bassett, one of the greatest ever for Ray. So she's screaming, Ray, Ray, what are you doing? What are you doing? And and Ray said, the script says it's supposed to win 11 nothing. <laughs> 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 so then Ray said, all right. He shut him down after that, but Ray Denzel scored five baskets. And one of the greatest players ever. True story. True story. So but uh -huh. now I mean, as far as Denzel's concerned, he won. <laughs> the script said Ray is supposed, G is supposed to win eleven. Nothing Denzel said. Hell to the knock. <laughs> I'll score at least one basket. He got five. That's Lucky incredible. Lucky shots that's that were going in. <laughs> that is incredible. Yes. Well, we, we, we certainly salute you for all you've done and continue to do, your impact on the culture and your mm -hmm. legend, not only basketball, but in life. Uh, Brooklyn's own orange and blue skies. Love you, bro, and certainly appreciate everything, and thank you for taking the time. And, 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 and one last thing. I long for the day where you're on the sidelines coaching. I don't want to get into it, the whys and where's, but the, you definitely should be. WNBA, WNBA, NBA, you should be a coach on a professional level. And we know why, but we're not going at it now. But... <laughs> The truth is the truth. And we all know how you set up that Golden State team. We know that. They know that. That doesn't happen overnight. Love you, bro. I appreciate you. <laughs> all right, man. Peace and love. All right, that's a wrap, Pops. But don't forget, y'all. Shout out to Underdog Fantasy. Click the link in the description. They're matching the first time deposit of up to $1,000. Use the promo code MARK. That's M-A-R-K. You'll also get a specialty pick. Appreciate y'all, man. Remember, tell somebody what they mean to you. Express your gratitude. Stop holding back. Do it now. A friend, Dr. Charles Jenkins, said, we are quicker to put flowers on somebody when they die than we are to give it to them when they were alive. Show your gratitude. Express some love. Blessings.